Okay, we now are back and we're talking about factors that limit the clock. Factors that limit the clock. We mentioned that these anticoagulants here help keep the clot from going too far and also help dissolve it a little bit. Heparin, which we'll again mention a little later, is produced by mast cells and basophils. Remember, they do the inflammation. They also produce histamine. And what it does is to complex with antithrombin factor three. So heparin does not work directly. It actually activates antithrombin factor three. Let's go back up here. See, here's antithrombin factor three. It's produced in the liver, as pretty much everything else is. And what it does is to inhibit thrombin, but it also inhibits other things too. It inhibits thrombin, but also inhibits, and these things here, you may recall, are primarily on the intrinsic side. So we'll be saying that heparin really kind of works more to, against the intrinsic side. Okay. So now I want to talk on plasminogen. Okay. So the clot is formed. Now we need to get rid of the clot. The clot is formed. We need to get rid of it. So we have this we call plasminogen. Now notice, I'm gonna, if I've never brought this up, ogen on the end of a word always means precursor. That means when you see ogen as a suffix on these clinical terms of physiologic, it means precursor. So I need to activate it. What can activate plasminogen to plasmin? Well, we can factor 11, 12 can start activating it. So you start activating it even before the clot is formed to keep it out of, and then something called tissue plasminogen activator could also do it. Now this here then can activate plasminogen to plasmin. Plasmin then dissolve the clot. Plasma dissolves the clot. So if somebody, so let me kind of give an example clinically. Joe starts having a blood clot in his blood vessel. We don't want that thrombus to become an embolus. So one of the things you could do is to give him anticoagulants. Heparin, let's say first, because it works quickly and can be given intravenously, and then send him home on an oral like Coumadin. Okay, but what about the clots that have already formed? We could give the patient tissue plasminogen activator that we can artificially make biotechnology, and it would convert in the body plasminogen to plasmin to attempt to dissolve the clot. So let's look at the terms. So when I gave, when we give the patient heparin or coumadin, that's an anticoagulant. That's preventing new clots. But then we could give the patient a thrombolytic agent. Let's look at that term. Thrombolytic to lyse the clots. And that could be the TPA, which would attempt to dissolve the clots that are already there. So again, the whole purpose of the, of the clot, the whole purpose of even hemostasis is to stop the blood flow until the blood vessel can be repaired. Once it's repaired, you want to get rid of the clotting material. Okay. All right. So we go we go further. So we've talked about that inhibition of clotting factors. Okay. Heparin we talked about. Unnecessary clotting can be prevented by various things. Here's some commercial anticoagulants. Heparin. When I say now your body makes heparin, but we also can make it ourselves and, and give it. It primarily works on, it activates antithrombin-3, and, and what it does is primarily inhibits the intrinsic pathway. We have another one called Coumadin, also called Warfarin. What it does is inhibit vitamin K. Now remember, there was some vitamin K-sensitive clotting factors, 2, 7, 9, and 10, and what it can do is inhibit those. 7 has the shortest serum half-life. Now, let me explain serum half-life, which you'll also hear in microbiology. Any, anything that you make in the body or any medication you take 
That's what we call a half-life. What it is is, let's say you had a uh, hundred milligrams of a substance that you took, antibiotic or whatever. What would be measured in the blood is how long it takes to get down to 50 milligrams, which means the half-life. How many hours or a days it takes to do that? That would be the half-life. Now, that determines then for pharma pharmaceuticals how often you have to take the medication before it drops the therapeutic level. Now, that means that if vitamin K was inhibited in some, some way, the first clotting factor that would have trouble and drop out of the blood and below the, the, the significant level would be seven. Now, if you go back, seven is located in the extrinsic pathway. So therefore, factor seven would have trouble with the extrinsic pathway. As a matter of fact, I'm going to type it in. The extrinsic pathway. So seven then would affect the extrinsic pathway, where heparin would affect, I mean, recumbent would affect the extrinsic, where heparin affects the intrinsic. The extrinsic pathway is measured by a clotting test we'll call the PT, the prothrombin time that we'll talk about. Now, we've got this other one called Xarelto, which, you, which you'll see on TV. See that X? It inhibits factor, factor X, factor 10. Now, factor 10, that's, that's X for those that aren't familiar with it. Let's put 10 here. Factor 10, if you recall, was present in both pathways. So factor 10 is present in both in both pathways because it's the pivotal to do the common pathway. So this is a very powerful medication right here, Xarelto. All right. Hemostasis, thromboembolic conditions. We already kind of talked about that. You can you can look at that yourself. The most common reason for a sudden heart attack, coronary, you know, when we get into heart and uh, is a sudden blood clot. We talked about emboli. So we can have a embolus go to the brain, which would be a stroke. New name now, instead of calling it stroke, that's the street term now, it's called a cerebrovascular accident. That's the new name. Hemostasis disorders. Here are some others. DIC, disseminating intravascular coagulation. What can happen? That can be heavily happening in obstetrics. I had a patient like that. All of a sudden, they were, uh, the, the placenta did not detach, and so they released substances into the circulation that caused clotting to just occur massively. The problem with disseminating intra intravascular coagulation is that you clot real quick, but then you consume the clotting factors. So in this particular patient, they started clotting fast, but then right after that, within minutes, all the clotting factors are consumed, so now they're bleeding too much. Okay. Thrombocytopenia, that was under the platelets. Hemostasis bleeding disorders, you can see here, let me kind of rearrange that, are some of the things that you can have. Here's some diagnostic blood tests here. The PT, and I put, you could go to Wikipedia. Sometimes I don't like it, but they had a pretty good deal on that. The PT is the prothrombin time. And what it does is primarily measure the, the uh, extrinsic, and the PTT measures the intrinsic. Then we got this called the international normalized ratio. Basically, just listen to me for a moment. So you come in and we want to see, let's say you come in and we see that you're either bleeding too much, which is one side of the coin, or clotting too much. So we want to do a clot, some clotting studies on you. Okay, so this is what we would do. You'd come in and we'd draw some blood from you. Okay, we would draw it in a test tube that does not allow the blood to clot in the test tube. Now remember, Blood will clot in a test tube because you got the glass there. Okay. Now, we want to do some clotting studies. So we, we want, want to draw the blood 
in a test tube that does not allow clotting. But we don't want to put an anticoagulant in there because that will mess up the test. So at the bottom of this particular test tube will be some little powder that will either be a citrate powder or an oxalate, a citrate or an oxalate. When we draw the blood in that test tube, then what will happen is the blood will mix with the citrate or oxalate and chelate, C-H-E-L-A-T-E, -E, the calcium. Remember, calcium is needed in almost every step. It will either form calcium oxalate or calcium citrate. So you'll pull the calcium out and the blood can't clot. Now, we've got another problem, though. You've all had blood drawn. The blood is going to slide down the glass before it gets to the bottom where the citrate or oxalate is. So the test tube is coated with generally with a silicon or a coating that makes it a non-wettable surface so that the blood will not activate the intrinsic pathway. So then the blood can't, get, can't clot on the glass and the calcium is tied up. The blood is then taken, the test tube is taken to the lab. The lab individuals will take out a little blood and let's say they're going to do the PT. What they would do is add calcium back and a little bit of tissue factor. Then they'd see how long it took to clot. It might take 10 to 13 seconds normally. That would be an evaluation of the PT, which would be the extrinsic. The extrinsic primarily is looking at factor seven. The intrinsic, they would take some more blood out and put in what we call tissue thromboplastin, which would then kick off the uh, intrinsic. And what that would do then is they would measure that. And that would be the PTT. That's the the intrinsic. The international normalized ratio, when it comes to the PT, it depends on where you got the tissue fat. Some get it from pigs, some get it from other substances, some artificially make it. With the PT then, there were so many irregularities between one hospital and the next that could cause serious problems because the PT is generally when you, is what you're using when you're using Coumadin and so forth, that, they, that the World Health Organization came up with a ratio to normalize the PT values, to normalize. So the INR is not actually a test, it's a calculation to normalize the PT values based upon where the particular hospital or laboratory obtained their tissue factor from. All right. And here's some other diagnostic tests that can be done, but these primarily are for anemia and things of that. Okay, I hope this kind of these three videos kind of helped you understand a vital thing, which is hemostasis.